He's a columnist for the Daily Beast USA Today. He's the host of a very popular podcast, Deep State Radio Podcast. He's super informed on Afghanistan, and he can help us now understand. So I'll ask a very broad question to start. What happened? <laughs> well, you know, it depends on how far you want to go back. People have been invading Afghanistan and failing for 3,000 years. So if you like, I could start with Alexander the Great. The United States started screwing up there 40 years ago. Uh, when we went in in 2001, uh, instead of just going in and getting rid of Osama bin Laden, which any president would have done, the Bush administration decided to remake Afghanistan somehow. Uh, that's something that always goes wrong for the United States. We're not really good at that. Uh, then they decided to do it with one arm tied behind their back by invading Iraq. Uh, and so here we are 20 years later. Uh, people have known that the Taliban was going to end up back in charge of Afghanistan for 10, 12 years. I wrote a column in 2010 saying we failed in Afghanistan. I was not alone. There were a lot of people who were saying that. People, military people serving on the ground said this is not going to work. Uh, but, you know, past presidents from both parties didn't want to have uh, the mess on their hands. They knew that this was going to fall apart when we left. Uh, Biden, to his credit, said, nope, this is not for us. We don't have a long-term interest here. I'm not going to send any more American troops to die here. I'm not going to spend billions more. We got to leave. Uh, and so he left. He thought things would remain a little more stable for a while because he thought, you know, we'd spend billions on the Afghan military and they'd hold it together and billions on the Afghan government and they'd hold it together. And neither of them did. They both just said, okay, we're done. How close 20 years ago was the United States to being able, with just a little bit of strength, a little bit of leadership, to end the Taliban? Well, I don't, I mean, first of all, I'm not sure that our objective ever was to end the Taliban. Our objective was to get Osama bin Laden. Uh, we were close at a couple of points to getting the Taliban to handing over Osama bin Laden. We were close, even during the Clinton administration, to getting Osama bin Laden before 9-11. So, you know, I, I, I just think, uh, you know, that, you know, that, 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 that question is not exactly the right question because this was about, you know, going in and, and, and seeking, you know, justice in the wake of, of the attacks uh, on the World Trade Center 20 years ago. But knowing what it appears that everyone knew, have we botched the exit of getting, our, getting Americans out of there and getting people from Afghanistan who have helped America, getting them out of there? Well, I, you know, I think... You know, there's a bunch of different ways to, to ex explain it. The president explained it yesterday by saying, look, the Afghan government um, completely folded like a house of cards. The president headed out the door, right? You know, with, apparently with helicopters full of cash. Um, the Afghan military said, we're not going to fight for that government. And, and so they didn't fight. So we expected there would be some resistance to the Taliban. There wasn't any resistance to the Taliban. Uh, and so now we end up with this situation. Now, I have to say, there by the end of today, there'll be 4,000 U.S. troops on the ground in Afghanistan. Ultimately, there'll be 6,000. And the Americans, it looks like, will get out. The allies will get out. Some of the people who worked with us will get out. Uh, and the Taliban aren't fighting it. So let's not judge what the exit looks like just yet. Give it a couple of weeks. What is your opinion of what the greatest failures were from America over the last 20 years on this, crossing all political boundaries, crossing, uh, crossing eras of politics in this country? The, the, Afghanistan is the biggest foreign... I mean, take Afghanistan and Iraq together. It's the biggest foreign policy screw up in American history. You know, you're talking about $3 trillion. You're talking about hundreds of thousands dead. You're talking about huge distraction of American resources. In Iraq, there were no WMDs. In Afghanistan, the mission just constantly morphed into something we couldn't do, which is remaking Afghanistan. Um, and we were distracted. And, you know, the Chinese and others were sitting there and sort of chuckling to themselves saying, well, sure, go spend trillions of dollars, America. Go focus your, your troops in these godforsaken places. Um, we're going to rebuild ourselves. China, you know, 
you know, rebuilt their infrastructure, became the world leader in green energy, became a giant economically uh, during this period, became the number two power in the world. What were we doing? We weren't rebuilding roads and highways and schools. We were fighting in Afghanistan and Iraq. It was a disaster up and down both political parties. Is America merely weak optically here, or is it a show of weakness? Um, I think it's a show of bad judgment. Uh, I think it's a show of, uh, uh, you know, our, our military leaders made the wrong calculations and then spent a lot of time covering their ass after that, trying to make it look like they didn't make the wrong calculation. We're not weak. You know, we've got the ability to defeat anybody, anywhere, anytime, if we have the will. But we didn't have the will to do that in Afghanistan, just like we didn't have the will to do that in Vietnam. And I think the lesson here is there are some things that we as a superpower can do that nobody else can do. And there's some things we can't do. And one of those is to remake a country that doesn't want to be remade. Can you put it in historical context against the Vietnam failure? It's very similar to the Vietnam failure, but that was previously our longest war, 18 years. This one's 20 years now. It's now our longest war. Uh, you know, when we ended there, it was a mess. Um, the other side won. Uh, they took over, in the, in the case of Vietnam, the, the North Vietnamese communists, in the case here, of the Taliban. Um, but, you know, you look at Vietnam, you know, 40 years later, and it's a tourist destination. Has sort of got a something of a market economy going. Things turned out well there. I don't expect that's going to happen in Afghanistan. And I think it's really hard to disconnect Afghanistan from what happened in Iraq. You know, those, you know, the Bush administration sort of launched us on those two things in tandem and taken together. What a mess. You know, much bigger, much more costly than Vietnam. Can you tell us what the greatest dishonesty was along the last 20 years there? I, there, look, <laughs> there's been an ocean of dishonesty, a tsunami of dishonesty, you know, saying we were going to go in and that we had a clear mission when we didn't, saying that we could achieve our goals of remaking the Taliban, remaking Afghanistan, saying it was just around the corner, saying, you know, let's put in another 10 or 20 or 30,000 troops and it'll make a difference. Let's stay another little longer and it'll make a difference. All those things were lies. Outside of never going in, what could they have done better, faster, if you get to play Monday morning quarterback here? What could, what would have minimized this being as awful as it was? Well, I think if we'd gone in, as any president would do, identified where al-Qaeda was, gone after al-Qaeda, eliminated al-Qaeda, and left, then we that would have been the right decision. It was It was expanding the mission to this idea of remaking Afghanistan. With what real objective? Was it to make money? Was it all the stuff covered in, in documentaries and vice? Was it all a lie in order to just to make a bunch of money for a bunch of people? Was it a money grab as a war? Look, I, I'm sure there was some element of that. Um, you know, going into Iraq, you know, was certainly tied to the interests of some people in the oil industry. Um, you know, the Halliburtons of this world did make some money. I think uh, some of it, however, it was tied to a, 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 a ludicrous concept. And this is hard for a lot of people to deal with. But after 9-11, we overreacted. We treated the threat posed by terrorists like we would treat an enemy nation. There were, at the time of 9-11, a few thousand terrorists, mostly living in poverty in caves around the world, in, you know, in backwaters. They were not that kind of a threat. But we launched something called the War on Terror, and we launched this war on terror uh, as if we were launching a world war. Who benefited from that? Arms manufacturers benefited enormously from that. Uh, should that have been our stance? No, it, sh it shouldn't have been our stance. Did some of the people who advocated truly believe this was a threat? I think they did. Were some of it in it for the cash? I think they were. So it was a mix. When you get most indignant about the th what's happened over the last 20 years and the, the macro view on this, what do you find most appalling? I find most appalling um, the sort of Washington bubble mentality that, you know, for political reasons or reputational reasons, led a bunch of people to keep kicking the can down the road and putting more 
American soldiers at risk, more Afghanistani citizens at risk, spending more money purely so that their resume would not have a big blot on it. Whose fault is this, David? Name names. Um, I, th- I think it's the fault of every American president since, uh, you know, Jimmy Carter. Uh, but if I had to pick one, it's George W. Bush for doing Afghanistan and doing Iraq the way that he did it. Um, should Barack Obama have gotten out? Yes, he should have. Should Donald Trump have tried to get out in an honest way instead of, you know, he, for a while there he wanted to hand the whole thing over to Blackwater? Yeah, he should have done that. Um, but I think the, the the person who, you know, and the administration that bear the most responsibility for this is 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 the Bush administration. Having said that, let's not forget the Taliban. They're the bad guys. <laughs> they took over the country. We don't control everything in the world. And... Um, you know, they, 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 they have a lot of responsibility for what's gone wrong in Afghanistan. David, can you be honest about this? The general lack of subtlety in the way that he asked you that you question mean? and told you to name names. He did. When you're, uh, you're fair-minded, you're a historian, you're, you're speaking in a tone that is, uh, that is not argumentative, and he just wants to do sports radio with you. Name names. Who's <laughs> to blame? Well, first of all, sports radio is a lot more entertaining than than political radio. Uh, And secondly, political radio has all turned into sports radio anyway. You know, I go on CNN and MSNBC all the time, and it's all just a cage match. They try to put you in with somebody who doesn't agree with you and have you get into a fight over naming names. This is actually a much more civilized and elevated discussion than I would expect in those places. It's all become argument television across politics where people are taking sides and you're just there to be fed to the piranha? Yeah, or to, or to, or to eat the other piranha. I mean, it's all, it's, it's cage match. It's all, it's all a fight. You know, they want a conflict. They want to, you know, I'm very, I've been on shows where people have said, and the guy on the other side is X, you know, we're, or the woman on the other side is X. And, you know, you're gonna, you know, we'll give you each a chance to vent your views. Um, uh, you know, and I, you know, I, I, I you know, the, the, the reality is though, with, you know, in defense here, names should be named. Thank you. Yeah. You know? yep. Names, names, names should be named. This, mm-hmm. this was a fiasco. Thousands of people paid with their lives. Trillions of dollars were spent. Didn't just happen. Somebody made a choice. What is not, not to put you in the CNN position, but what is the argument against what you're saying? Uh, we are in terms of, you know, taking time to assess the response in the evacuation in terms of could we have stayed a little bit longer so that, you know, they're not people climbing aboard airplanes to try and get out of Afghanistan. Like what what is the argument against what you're saying? I think the one argument, you know, they'll stay a little bit longer argument, um, you know, is, well, we could have planned this better. But of course, I think what that argument fails to take into consideration is we don't control all the variables. We didn't control what the Afghan government was going to do or what the Afghan army was going to do or what the Taliban was going to do. Could we have expected they were going to do this? Yes. Now, President Biden yesterday said that they wanted to evacuate people earlier and the Afghan government said, no, we don't want that. It'll cause a panic. So, you know, we can dig deep in this, but I I believe the counter argument to that argument is we were there for 20 years. You know, it's five years ago, the Taliban controlled 40 percent of Afghanistan. We knew this was going to happen. So, you know, how many years, how many troops, how many trillions of dollars until you prove the theory is wrong? It's fine to say all of that, David, of expectation, and it's fair to say all of that. But when you're met with the heartbreaking desperation video of people falling from airplanes, that when you're when you're met with that video, that exit can't be expected. You've got to do better than that. It can't. The exit can't look like that. I totally agree with you. No, you know it is so nauseating. The echoes with nine eleven are horrifying. I saw a shot this morning of you know the runway at the airport with shoes strewn across the runway. Um, you know, the human story is horrible and it's going to get worse. Uh, the question is, you know, after almost 200,000 people in Afghanistan have died in the past 20 years, what would the cost of keeping the war on be? 
And if you're in a situation you don't control and you're leaving a country in the kind of circumstance we're in, as we did in Vietnam, you have to expect the end is going to be messy. So yeah, it's awful. And we got to do everything we can to reduce the risk and the, the human suffering from this thing. Um, but we can't let that be an excuse, the fear of that being an excuse from doing what is ultimately the right thing and the greater good. David, a lot of people were making a lot out of Russia's embassy not having to be evacuated, China's embassy not having to be evacuated. Now, some of that might be as easy as they haven't been fighting an act of war within the region. But what do you say to people highlighting that as a, a signifier that Russia has been heavily involved here with the Taliban? Well, Russia has been involved. Of course, you know, the Taliban was created in part in response to the Soviet Union a long time ago. Uh, the Chinese role is, I think, even more important here. Uh, China shares a border with Afghanistan. Uh, the Chinese have been speaking to the Taliban. Uh, and I think the Chinese are going to be our primary interlocutor because, you know, we're going to care about human rights. We're going to care about women and, and girls and education there but we're not gonna have any influence, the Chinese will. And I think one of the things we're gonna to have to do going forward is figure out how to work with them, how to pressure them, how to cajole them into producing the kind of outcomes we want. Fortunately, for a lot of the wrong reasons, the Chinese are as afraid of violent Islamist extremists as we are. And so they wanna keep a lid on this country too. Maybe, maybe you know, in the general scheme of things, uh, you know, it's time they sort of took over this assignment from us. David, thank you for being on with us. One last question before you go. The last 20 years of the United States in Afghanistan, the most positive thing that can be said for it, the, the most fruit that can possibly be uh, wrung from it is what? Uh, I, you know, I think there were a lot, thousands and tens of thousands of Afghanistani girls that got an education, that had a hope that went out into the Western world and, and, and went to university. Uh, that, you know, when we took over the country, nobody had a cell phone. Today, 70% of the people had a cell phone. They're much more aware of the options that exist in the world. I think progress makes the ultimate success of the Taliban much less likely uh, than any fighting that we have done would have done. David, thank you for being on with us. Thank you for the time. My pleasure. Thank you very much.